Okay, hello, good afternoon. Thank you for choosing this session. Um, <clears throat> it's after lunch, a difficult spot, as we all know. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, light and interesting. So, um, in this talk, I want to cover two basic subjects. Uh, the first is an introduction to the work that my team at the Wikimedia Foundation is doing. That is the Community Development Team. It's a new team that was set up a few months ago. Um, but it includes, it now includes work that I have been doing for several years now uh, as part of my previous team. Where should I move to stop this? I think maybe you should do the way like, yeah, move it. I don't know. Yeah, it's too loud, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'm using the microphone for your recording. But I also have a fairly loud voice. I can speak without it if that would be better. Okay, better now? It's a small bowl. Yeah. Um, how about without the microphone? Is that okay? Yeah. Is it okay for the recording? Yeah. Without a microphone? Okay. All right. So, uh, like I said, two main topics I want to cover. One is the work that we are doing in the community development team, um, and uh, I will present uh, that is skill building. And the other topic I want to raise today is a culture of experimentation. I want to have a quick discussion with you about the possibilities of experimentation in our wiki communities. So, let's get right to it. Uh, a word about who I am, for those who don't know me. Um, I have been working for the foundation for eight years. Before that, I have been a volunteer with the Wikimedia movement for 10 previous years. I started editing in 2001. I joined the foundation in 2011. So I've been around a long time as a volunteer and also a long time now as an employee of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, in the past, I have dealt with uh, grants, with the affiliations committee, um, but now I'm focused on this work, the work of skill and capacity building. This is all. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Thank you for 
choosing this session. <coughs> um, <coughs> it's after lunch, a difficult spot, as we all know. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, light and interesting. So, um, in this talk, I want to cover two basic subjects. Uh, the first is an introduction to the work that my team at the Wikimedia Foundation is doing. That is the Community Development Team. It's a new team that was set up a few months ago. Um, but it includes, it now includes work that I have been doing for several years now uh, as part of my previous team. Where should I move to stop this? I think maybe you should use the waiter. Like, yeah, move it. I don't know. Yeah, it's too loud, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'm using the microphone for your recording. But I also have a fairly loud voice. I can speak without it if that would be better. Okay, better now? It's a small roll. Yeah. Um, how about without the microphone? Is that okay? Yeah? Is it okay for the recording? Without the microphone? Okay. Alright, so uh, like I said, two main topics I want to cover. One is the work that we are doing in the community development team. Um, and uh, I will present it uh, as skill building. And the other topic I want to raise today is a culture of experimentation. I want to have a quick discussion with you about the possibilities of experimentation in our wiki communities. So, let's get right to it. Uh, a word about who I am, for those who don't know me. Um, I have been working for the Foundation <coughs> for eight years. Before that, I have been a volunteer with the Wikimedia movement for 10 previous years. I started editing in 2001. I joined the foundation in 2011. So I've been around a long time as a volunteer and also a long time now as an employee of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, in the past, I have dealt with uh, grants, with the affiliations committee, um, but now I'm focused on this work, the work of skill and capacity building. This is all part of the Community Engagement Department. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about who I am. I'm also, in, in my past life, before I joined the foundation, I was working as a software uh, developer. So, um, I'm a recovering programmer, uh, so to speak. Um, and my academic field is classics. I study ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, just to give you a fuller picture of who I am and what my particular weirdnesses are, dead languages. Um, okay, so community development, what does that mean? Um, it is a new team, but like I said, the program, the, the main program uh, I've been working on started before this team was set up, and it's called Community Capacity Development. Community Capacity Development, or CCD for short. And that program was based on the idea that there are certain abilities, certain capacities that every Wikimedia community needs. In every community, in every language, in every country needs certain skills. Some of them are technical skills, like bots and automation, uh, or mass uploading of images. And others are organizational skills like event production or partnership building skills, how to approach and create partnerships. Uh, these are all very uh, um, uh, different skills and none of us is born with all of those skills and most of our communities don't have great skills at all of these capacities. We grow them, we develop them as we can and based on the people we have around us, right? Some communities, for example, are fortunate to have um, a lawyer among their volunteers. So legal matters are easier to solve because, you know, there's someone who's a professional. In other communities, it so happens, don't have a lawyer. Some communities have a professional PR or communications person. 
so their work with the media is easier, right? And others do not. My point is, these are things we all need to various, to, to, and we all have to varying degrees. Um, and the idea of this program is that some communities are stuck or have plateaued at a certain level that they cannot um, exceed or they cannot grow from, but maybe with a little boost, with a little uh, help, a one-time um, engagement to help them build that capacity, that community can continue to grow organically. Okay, because obviously the foundation cannot support all the communities in all the capacities all the time. The program was a pilot program to try this approach of identifying a particular community that needs help with a particular skill that it either lacks <coughs> or has trouble developing and to see if we can develop it in a short-term uh, engagement of just a few months to see if we can help that community along so that they can uh, level up or, or uh, grow that capacity and overcome that obstacle to its growth. Was this clear so far? Is my English clear? Do you need me to speak slower or louder? Do you know that theory uh, that people sometimes have that if they speak loudly at you, then you will understand? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Just a theory. <laughs> no, no, it is completely unscientific. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it began as a pilot program. We did a lot of research before we began. We wanted to know what communities are telling us their biggest problems were. Now, we talked to um, over um, 20 different communities in in-depth interviews of two or three hours, and we asked all kinds of questions from um, tell us what's, what's troubling you, what are your biggest problems, to very detailed questions like uh, how do admins get selected in your community? And are they selected for life? Or do they have a term? Or, you know, how do you resolve conflicts in your community? All kinds of questions like that. And we got the kind of knowledge base of how different communities deal with different things. Based on that research, we selected three communities for our pilots. We wanted communities from relatively large countries to maximize the impact. And we picked uh, Brazil, uh, India, specifically the Tamil community in southern India, and Ukraine. And in each of those communities, we piloted a different kind of capacity. We wanted to help the Brazilians with their communications. So the Brazil community was an example of a community that is large, active, has a lot of technical people, but for whatever reason, <coughs> did not develop media relations. They did not issue press releases, for example, about their projects. They were doing awesome work, and they were not telling the media about it, right? Or, and they did not have, uh, you know, a press kit, like a, a contact point for journalists who want to do an item about Wikipedia. They didn't have that, so journalists weren't reaching them, and they were writing poorer uh, media items because of it. I'm sure you've all seen poor media coverage of Wikipedia by journalists who just don't get it. Um, <clears throat> and in Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians told us that their biggest problem was conflict. Now, do you have conflict on your wiki? Of course. Of course. Of course. That was not a trick question. <laughs> yes, we all have conflict on our wiki. Conflict is what happens when humans are put together in the same place. There's conflict. Uh, but the Ukrainians thought that their ability to deal with the conflict that inevitably happens was poor. They wanted help in de doing better uh, in dealing with conflict. So that was, that's what we helped them do. For these interventions, we developed completely new curriculum, um, technical skills with the Tamils, communications with the Brazilians, uh, and conflict uh, management with the Ukrainians. We, de we delivered this training in weekend-long two-day training in each country in the local language, okay, not in English, using, using interpreters, um, and then we, we had an evaluation, there's a report, there's a link in my slides, my slides will be linked from the program, uh, after my talk I will, <coughs> so you can 
then you can click on this link and read this report if you want. It's a report about those pilot years, and it includes um, recommendations because it was a pilot. Right? So at the end of the pilot, we evaluated it. Uh, we thought it was a successful pilot because these communities reported that they were happy with the intervention, and I'll share some quotes. Um, but the Wikimedia Foundation did not make a decision following this pilot. The foundation didn't decide to scale it up, and it also didn't decide to shut it down. Um, instead, by inertia, uh, we just got uh, to do more piloting at the same kind of pilot uh, budget, the same kind of modest uh, one-man program uh, for this. And we did. We did do more piloting. For example, I spent an entire month in India teaching Wikidata, Wikidata to various Indian communities in each of the big cities of India. Uh, okay, so I spent a whole month there, and until that visit, there were only a handful of people in all of India, which has many, many Wikipedians, only a handful of them were actively engaging with Wikidata. Actively, I mean not just translating labels into the local language, which is kind of the simplest way to engage with Wikidata, but actually modeling items, adding properties, like re queries, like really engaging with Wikidata. And following this trip, um, each of those local communities, the Bangla, the Tamil, the Malayalam communities, developed at least a core of Wikidata enthusiasts, including technical people, who were then able to spread that training. Okay, but someone needed to jumpstart that in India. For whatever reason, it wasn't happening on its own. In other countries, it did happen on its own, right? We didn't go to each country and kind of start a Wikidata group there, but in all of India, there was not that kind of momentum of someone to just pick up and start teaching Wikidata to others. So that artificial visit by me to India that month actually got things going, and nobody will ever have to go to India again to teach Wikidata. That, that problem is solved, you know? Now there's local expertise in multiple parts of India who can teach Wikidata to others. So this is a classic example of the impact that we were hoping for, right? To find that, that spot that with a little bit of help can go on growing on its own. Is this clear? The model? <clears throat> so, does this work? Do these interventions, capacity building efforts, do they work? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, it does work, and it also has some uh, long-term benefits. Um, for example, the material that I created for those Wikidata trainings, I put it online, I also recorded a video. How many of you know my Wikidata trainings? Yeah. Some of you know them. Three hours. What? Three hours. Yes, the three hour, yeah, the three hour video introduction to Wikidata. Yeah, I also have a seven minute version. <laughs> but I cover a little less in seven minutes. Uh, yeah, so that video, for example, that was built for the Indians. That was built for that program. But it was consumed by other people all over the world. People I would never have personally reached. So the materials we created as part of this project have been reused. Uh, the conflict management materials as well have been uh, delivered in other conferences outside Ukraine uh, since then. So this program also just builds up um, instructional material uh, in the movement. So some people were skeptical about this approach because it's high touch. High touch is a kind of business term from the US meaning a lot of involvement, right? It's not like a, you push a button and it happens, right? High touch, you have to engage with people, you have to travel to that country, that's called high touch approach. And people were skeptical about it because what's easiest for the foundation to do is to invest in technology, right? Because technology we understand, technology we can do, technology we can recruit talent for, and when we solve a problem with technology, when we create a tool, or a new feature, everybody benefits, right? Automatically, 300 communities, 800 communities, whatever. Uh, everybody can use the tool, and that's how we save the world, right? Wrong. Technology cannot solve all of our problems. For example, our very talented software engineers cannot solve how to deal with problematic humans. That's a fundamentally 
uh, wetware problem, not software problem. You know, it's, it's a meat space problem. It's between humans, and we need human skills to deal with conflict and to deal with toxic personalities. And yes, some tech can help with that, actually. We have the Community Health Initiative, right, that's building better blocking tools and interaction mappers and all kinds of things. That's, that's great, but that still isn't the core investment we need to make to solve the problem of toxicity on the projects. Okay, so tech was easy to understand, easy to invest in. This kind of approach of going to communities and working with them in person, in their language, was harder for the foundation to invest in, right? Because obviously, it doesn't scale as easily as software does, right? You have to do it again and again with each group of people, with each language. Um, but the lesson we learned from doing this is that communities really appreciated the fact that we gave them uh, direct attention to their context, in their country, in their language, and were available to them uh, to help them. And ultimately, those communities that we worked with did level up. They did manage to create those capacities. I won't go into details, it's all in the report that I linked if you're interested. But um, all of these interventions um, succeeded. Uh, the, the crucial bit of having it in person, in language, in country, cannot be overstated. There's a limit to what we can do with um, a hangout video call in English, mm -hmm. even if people from all over the world attend it. Right? If we don't create materials in Arabic, in French, in Vietnamese, we will always leave out a lot of people who just don't have the English to participate. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, like I said, the materials we created are significantly reusable because, in fact, a lot of the needs that are specific to this one community are not global, they're not shared by everyone, but they are shared by a few other communities, and, they, and the material can be reused. <clears throat> um, so, like I said, the materials were used in other uh, conferences, it was used by other people, and I want to share a few quotes from the people who have undergone the CCD programs. The quality and depth of the training by experienced WF staff can't be matched by outsiders. Very few people can come to the international events. We need the Wikimedia Foundation to come to communities in their own countries, ideally in their own language. Um, some a person said, I was aware of Wikidata, but found it complicated, too confusing to understand, beyond interwiki. Uh, now, I think it is the future of Wikipedia. My mind was blown. I was inspired and started contributing massively. By the way, Wikidata is not the future of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is here to stay. Wikidata will never replace Wikipedia's ability to tell a story, to put a narrative. Okay? This, this person was just really excited. <laughs> um, I attended lectures about Wikidata, but not one had engaged me and made me actually want to contribute. I was finally <coughs> persuaded that I should invest time and go to actively contribute to Wikidata. This is a person who's been in the movement for 15 years, but just didn't get why they should care about Wikidata. Following one of these trainings, they're on board. <clears throat> So, the obvious question, okay, these are very happy people, but does it scale? And my answer to that is yes, it scales. It doesn't scale like visual editor scales, right? Visual editor just works across all the wikis and all the languages, and that's great. But it scales across time. By sowing these seeds, like I said, nobody will ever have to teach Indians Wikidata ever again. I have sown those seeds, and now there's plenty of people in, in India who can teach others Wikidata. In that sense, it scales over time, right? The, the 20 or 30 people I have trained in each of those cities, uh, let's say maybe 5 or 10 of them really got it and got a strong understanding, those people are now training other rooms of 20 and 30 people. In that sense, it scales. And when capacity building is done effectively, then that capacity stays built. Meaning, there is at least that core of people who can build it on, who can teach it to others, who can train others, including train others in ways I can't, for example. Um, I, I'm training in English, they can train in the local language. I'm training from 
my world of associations and perspective and experience, their training, their fellow community members from their the shared world and, and of experiences. They have better examples than I do, etc. Um, and like I said, in the uh, model of the program, we did show that once that initial obstacle, the lack of knowledge or the lack of motivation, once that was overcome, the community did continue to grow organically. They did continue to develop things. They weren't just practicing what I taught them. They were building on that and, and creating their own. Uh, it is a high investment activity, capacity building. It did take a long time to design those materials, to plan the event, to bring everybody into the same place. I mean, Brazil, for example, is a large country. I had to fly Wikimedians from all over to get them in one room to do the training. It was expensive. Um, but it's a good investment if the training is effective. It's a good investment. It's worth all that money and all that time. And crucially, this kind of capacity building fulfills a need that is not being met by any other method at the moment. It's not being met by tech. It's not being met by external partners. There is no one else at the moment to teach Wikimedia volunteers some of these things that we were teaching as part of this program. So it was answering or fulfilling a need that no one else was addressing. Okay, so we had a program, it was successful, the model works, so now what? So now this community development team, this new team is working on four main initiatives. The first is a community capacity map, I'll explain in a moment. The second is a new online learning platform. The third is empowering proven trainers. And the fourth is a learning request channel. I'll explain each of these now and then we'll have a quick discussion. So the community capacity map is one of the recommendations that came out of the pilot program. And it's an effort to map the current state of the different capacities in each of your communities. We want to know, so remember the Ukrainians told me that they have a trouble <coughs> dealing with conflict. Who else has trouble dealing with conflict? Who has it figured out? Who else needs help dealing with the media? Who has it figured out? Who, has, who needs help building partnerships? Do you see what I'm saying? I want to get some kind of map of the relative uh, current capacities in different communities. And I'm uh, pursuing it through a page called CCM on Meta, Community Capacity Map and in which I am trying to get communities to self-assess, to self-assess, tell me what is your current level at each of 30-something capacities that I have described. So, I will show this in a moment. I wrote a, a guidelines page that actually says uh, about um, media relations, for example. If you don't do press releases, and you don't have a press kit, and you don't have a contact point, then your capacity is none. If you do have a contact point for the press, but you don't do active press releases and interviews, etc., then your capacity is low. You know, it's like a, it's like a quiz, like a self, uh, what's it called, you know, in, in magazines, you know, that you can kind of uh, uh, diagnose yourself. Yeah, a scorecard, yeah. So you can just kind of look at it and say, hmm, do we have low capacity or medium capacity according to this description? Uh, and then you can come up with a, a, a rating. Um, you can do it in a group, in your user group, or your chapter, or your community. It doesn't even have to be an existing affiliate. You can give a rating to the entire Arabic Wikipedia, for example. Now, a self-assessment is, I hear you say, well, is that reliable? Is that scientific? Uh, no, no, it's not scientific. And it's not reliable in the sense that I can guarantee that if someone said they have high capacity, then they have high capacity. What I can guarantee is that they think they have high capacity. They're telling me they have high capacity. And in this particular case, people don't really have an incentive to uh, overstate their capacity because this is about getting help from the foundation. So, you know, if you say, we have high capacity in everything, I'll say, okay, congratulations, and I'll move on to another community, right? So if you want to get some help and resources from the foundation, you actually have an interest 
in, in sharing a, a realistic picture of your uh, capacities. Now, the idea is not only that I would be able to know what is the situation in your community or affiliate, but that I would be able to recognize patterns. If I, for example, see that across most of the groups of Wiki Arabia, uh, you report that you have trouble, I don't know, creating partnerships, then partnerships training should be part of the agenda for next Wiki Arabia. Right? That makes sense. Or maybe not Wiki Arabia, maybe I should come specially and do some kind of partnership training event. There's plenty of seats over here. Could you help the people who just came in make it to the other side? Maybe some of you could move and then. Yes. So uh, the idea is that if we can recognize patterns of need, um, I and others at the foundation would be able to mobilize resources accordingly. If, for example, I see that a lot of people in, uh, in Latin America need help with a particular topic, and I have a trainer who speaks Spanish who can deliver training on that topic, I can make that match based on the information I will be gathering in this map. Um, so, you're all encouraged to do this. I have announced this a while ago. Maybe you missed that announcement, um, but ideally, if you uh, fit, fill it out, you will also be able to have a conversation among yourselves in your group, in your uh, chapter, user group, uh, about your capacities, and eventually you'll be able to also say, ha, huh, we have low capacity in this, maybe that's a, a, a topic for us to work on, and we have low capacity in this, but that's less important for us, so we won't be working on it. You, it. It can feed into your own strategic planning or annual planning, whatever kind of planning you do in your group. Um, and finally, uh, originally I did this on Meta, in a giant table of death. Uh, I mean, it wasn't technically lethal, but it was a really big, unfriendly table. And a uh, Latvian volunteer helpfully created this tool uh, it's linked from the slides, which will be linked from the program. And it's also just, uh, if you know the tools, tool uh, labs, it's just a tool called CCM. And it's a tool that allows you to fill in uh, each of the capacities. I'll zoom in a bit so you can see better. So, you can uh, look at other communities' uh, ratings. Or you can, uh, <coughs> yeah, you can see what they've rated and what they haven't. You can add your own organization, and it shows you, you know, it's like a, it's like a little app. It uh, will show you one capacity at a time with that, just that guideline um, from my page, right? Like if you have this, then it's low. If you have this, then it's medium, etc. I don't want to go into too much detail here. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail in the page. If this is new to you, if you're interested, check it out. Uh, on Meta, just go to a page called CCM, uh, and you will see it. All right. Uh, let's go back to the slides here. Um, so that's the community capacity map. Um, the second thing we're working on is an online learning platform. And here we want to create a... <coughs> resource for self-learning. So this complements the, the, the program I just described, where we come to your country, to your community, in your language, etc. This is an online platform, uh, which of course is more scalable. It's not as good as in-person training, but it's, it's better in certain respects for people who, for whatever reason, can't come to events, or don't speak English and need it in their own language, need to translate it. Um, or uh, prefer self-study in their own pace, in their own uh, environment. Um, and, and the many, many people who will never reach our events for, for any reason at all. Visa problems, economic issues. Um, we need an online uh, solution as well. Think about MOOCs, if you know MOOCs, if you know the, the MOOC that uh, the Algerians have made. Um, so it'll be like a MOOC platform. And the idea would be that there will be video and written tutorials and modules, but they will be arranged into courses so that um, 
even though it will largely be a repackaging of a lot of information that already exists, exists out there, it's on meta, you know, someone has documented it, it's on meta, um, this will actually put it in a learning resource with, with some rhetorical structure, some didactic uh, uh, intent behind it. So that, for example, if we want to create a partnership with a museum, and the museum will love us and say, yes, I'm happy to share all of my images with you. Here, 40,000 image files and a very large XML file. Enjoy. Do you know what to do with that? It takes several different skills to actually deal with that kind of mass media information. And we will have a course, an actual course with multiple modules that will teach you those skills one by one. How to deal with the XML, what does it mean to deal with metadata from another organization, how to deal with the actual mass upload, how to use a tool like Patipan uh, or other tools, right? Um, what, do, what to do afterwards, how do we deal with the commons community uh, to, to make them uh, receptive to this mass ingestion of data, how do we connect it to Wikidata, etc., etc. Uh, the idea is that this knowledge still is, already exists somewhere out there, on Meta and on the Outreach Wiki and in Facebook groups and in random emails that people sent, but there's no course, there's no thing you can take and, and tell yourself, okay, if I follow these 17 modules, at the end, I will have what I need to deal with a mass image donation. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're going to reinvent all the teaching materials out there, it's more like we're going to rationalize them and package them into uh, up-to-date, digestible, properly presented bits that actually take you um, through a certain set of skills towards a certain goal. Um, this, the, the materials will all be translatable so that people eventually will be able to consume the modules in their own language. Um, it will be a private platform. It won't be on uh, Coursera or, or Facebook or something like that, it will be uh, using Wikimedia accounts, so you'll be able to use and log in and authenticate with your Wikimedia account. And um, optionally, optionally, you will be able to allow us to track your progress. I mean, the, the platform <coughs> will show you your progress, but if you allow us, if you allow us at the foundation to also see your progress, this would allow us to discover you as a resource for our trainings or projects. It will allow me to have a better answer to questions like, who knows how to deal with massive data donations and speaks Arabic, for example? Right now, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know who in, among all of you speaks Arabic, and knows how to deal with a massive data donation. Maybe there, there already are some people among you who do that. I don't know that. Right? Now, there's a lot of people I know in the movement, there's a lot of people, if you ask me who does this and that, I can say, oh, that guy, this person. Um, but it shouldn't really depend, you know, on the people Asaf has met. Right? Or the people Asaf has already talked to. That's not a good model, it's not a scalable model, and it's not a fair model. Because I'll always point at the people I've worked with in the past, right? I actually want to discover new people, people who have gone through the course, have the skills, and are interested in helping, either in their own country or in other countries that speak the same language, which uh, leads me to the next, um, yes, to the next uh, slide of empowering proven trainers. Right? We, uh, uh, so far, the program largely depended on me personally traveling and giving instructions, sometimes with translators, right, to, to, to do it in the local language. <coughs> but I was basically delivering all the instruction. I'm happy to do it. I love spending time with Wikipedians, but also that does not scale. I cannot be everywhere. I cannot meet everyone. And I want to empower existing proven trainers. When I say proven trainers, I mean not just someone who says, oh yeah, I know bots. I can teach it. I want to know that they really can teach it. Because not everyone who knows how to build a bot knows how to teach how to build a bot. Uh, I am very passionate on this particular topic of the quality of teaching. And I have seen 
also in my previous work as a grantmaker at the foundation, I have seen a lot of well-intended efforts fail because they sent a person who didn't know how to teach well uh, on a teaching mission. And it just didn't work. And it was a waste of everyone's time and, and an exercise in frustration. So that's why I'm emphasizing here that we want to empower people who actually are effective trainers, and then we will be able to send them, to, to cultivate them, to teach them, to give them materials, and to fund their travel to do teaching, um, again, in, in their countries or, or in other countries, uh, or even to, to learn more, like to cultivate them and upskill them, the trainers, even further in uh, get-togethers with uh, other experts. Um, however, this plan is not budgeted yet, so nothing is going to happen on this particular uh, bullet in the coming months. I hope we can do more about it next year. But I wanted you to know that that's something we're thinking about in terms of scaling up the impact of community development, is to no longer depend just on one or one and a half people doing the training, but to actually find more community trainers to empower. Um, and finally, um, the learning request channel is a new channel we are designing where we want to enable all of you to make any kind of request related to learning. Anything you want to learn. Come in. Um, <clears throat> anything you want to learn, anything you want uh, help with, with a skill, with acquiring some knowledge, you'll be able to use this channel, you'll be able to make requests in any language, um, and you will be able to request support. Now, the support we can give will vary depending on a lot of things, depending on our budget, depending on our schedule, depending on our existing commitments. Also, frankly, depending on the size of the community, because we have to make that kind of uh, ruthless prioritization of you know large countries or, or uh, uh, groups that are serving large populations. For example, the Arabic language, it's a huge population. Um, need to be prioritized over very, very, much, much smaller uh, communities, assuming we cannot serve everyone. Of course, the materials and the things that we build for everyone will be available to those smaller communities, but I'm telling you in advance, we will have to prioritize, and uh, size matters in this. Um, so it depends on all these things, but we will help you with uh, anything from maybe just a link, you know, maybe you have a question and we say, oh yeah, there's a good tutorial right here. And you're off, and that's it, that's all you needed. You just needed a pointer, and we can provide that. Uh, and all the way through uh, mentorship calls, um, uh, uh, video chats to, to, to share a screen and show you how it's done, uh, and all the way to funded events like learning days uh, that can be a pre-conference or post-conference around a regional conference like Wiki Arabia. There is no learning days this time around, but there are learning days before Wikimania, uh, sometimes before the Berlin conference, uh, sometimes before other regional conferences like Wiki Arabia. So that's, that's something that my team is also responsible for. The idea though is that this is the one channel where you are guaranteed, I stress this because a lot of our channels do not guarantee you a response. So here I'm speaking for my team, I can guarantee you a response. In this channel, it's not open yet, we're working on it. When we build it, you will be guaranteed a response to your learning request. Even if the response is, you know what, we can't help you with that one. Because we don't know, or because we're, we're too busy, or whatever. But you will get a response to your um, support requests, if they are about learning. It's not an overall Wikimedia Foundation complaint channel, right? This is about learning for your community. So these are the four um, subjects that my team is working on. <coughs> um, yes, I just said this. Um, and now we have some time for a quick discussion. What kind of skill building is most needed in Wiki Arabia communities? I would like to hear some thoughts from you. Anyone? Yes. Uh, I guess that is communication. Uh, because we have many different communication channels we use, and sometimes you just cannot follow up with everything happening. Um, so 
I always envision that we'll use only one communication channel that is useful for everybody, which is accessible for, to everybody. Mm. And that way you can actually keep up with what's happening. Every time there is a, a, a local, um, um, something happening, uh, or a regional mm -hmm. uh, event, it is just too much work to keep up with. Yeah, so the, the challenge of internal communications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like inside the movement. Yeah. Other thoughts? What would you like to see your community in particular or Wiki Arabia in general get help building? Yes? One of the major points for um, the community, but not only the community, the Arabic Wikipedia community, but the user groups of the Arabic region would be the governments. The groups, self governance, that would be very, very important point to emphasize. Um, in the local communities in order to be able to work within their own local communities as well as with other um, communities so we can see partnerships between us like on a better scale um, now we work together we're still doing it on a volunteer basis we're still doing it with the self like, skills that we earn from life which are not specifically um, pushing our limits and uh, getting us better benefit out of the, I mean, out of the opportunities that we're getting. So uh, yeah. governance, self-governance is very, very important. Yeah, governance is, is a typical problem that a lot of our communities face, just because the kind of people who tend to become Wikipedians usually aren't the kind of people who already have a lot of governance experience, usually. And so that's usually not one of the skills that you just find among the, the Wikipedians in your group, and it's something we need to develop. Uh, nobody's born with it. I've had to develop it in the Wikipedia groups I was part of as well. Um, and I agree with you, it's a, it's a major topic, and it's not just, I mean, if, for those of you who may not have given a lot of thought to governance, it may sound like a bit of a dry topic. Oh, governance that has to do with like forms and compliance and stuff. Well, yes, that's part of governance. But that's not actually the hardest part of governance. Governance is a lot more about human skills, about how to build a team, how to share responsibility, how to go through about decision making, how to do planning without alienating uh, people who maybe didn't support one of the ideas in the plan. These are all uh, human skills and have a lot to do with conflict and communication, um, and that all comes under achieving good governance. So absolutely, that would be a, a good emphasis, I think, for future investment in, in Wiki Arabia. Other thoughts, comments? Yes, I think uh, we need to uh, have a good uh, process to motivate the community, to motivate the volunteers. Volunteer motivation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little more? Well, like what? what uh... <laughs> because uh, in the Arabic world, there is a lot of uh, there is not a lot of people who want to become a uh, volunteer like, like this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the community don't, doesn't, doesn't grow, mm -hmm. so we are small. So, so how to attract small. more yeah. people yeah, yeah, yeah. to volunteer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, volunteer uh, motivation, volunteer retention. Once they're here, how to retain them, how to keep them with us. Uh, are also perennial topics, they're, they're relevant to almost all the groups. And actually, it's an excellent segue to the last topic I wanted to cover, uh, which is this idea of a culture of experimentation that I want to suggest to you. And uh, it ties into what you said, because that's one of my examples. So, I want to start with, with this uh, axiom that change is healthy. In the early days, many of you are younger, newer uh, Wikipedians who don't remember the, the early days in 2001, 2, 3, 4, but in the early days we made up the rules as we went. There was no rule on how to do an encyclopedia on a wiki. We had to invent things like notability. You know, we just figured it out one day and then we changed it and changed it again and again and again. Even though today if you come to established wikis like Arabic, like French, like English, it seems etched in stone, you know, the notability policy, but it isn't. It, it's just no longer changing as fast, as rapidly as it used to, okay? But we used to make things up as we went, and now many of these things are less changeable, but I want to suggest to you that wikis 
thrive on change, on adaptation. That's the, the wiki's greatest strength, right? Is that it's so dynamic that you don't need to build a software feature to do something new on a wiki. For example, when conflicts erupted in early Wikipedia and we needed some way to resolve conflicts, what did we do? We started a page, just a blank page on the wiki, and we said, dispute resolution. Take your disputes here. Right? That's it. Right? It wasn't a new software feature. It was a new wiki page. The wiki page allows you to, to legislate, to create new things just by starting a new page. That adaptability, that, that flexibility is one of our strengths. I want to suggest to you that when the stakes are high, it's really hard to determine which change is desirable. And those of you who have been around for a bit have probably seen attempts to change some of the core policies on your wiki that have a really hard time getting moving. You know, someone makes a suggestion, oh, maybe we should change this, and 15 people come and say, no, we shouldn't do that, right? And then that someone says, oh, okay, you know, and that's it, and the initiative is gone. Or maybe a lot of people want change, but a lot of other people resist change, and there's a huge exhausting discussion, and at the end of the exhausting discussion, people are exhausted, so they walk away, right? The change was not done, but also the problem that the change was supposed to solve is not solved, right? What have we achieved? We have exhausted each other, right? And we just walk away and never want to hear about it again. Is this, is this familiar? Have you experienced this? Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> When we ask ourselves, should we change the notability policy? How, should we change how we welcome newbies? Should we accept oral citations? These are questions that have been debated in, in circles a lot. But um, I want to suggest to you that experiments are an excellent way to stop exhausting each other. If you're able to say, okay, we think X and you think not X. Is there an experiment that we can design that will help one, one side or another come around? Is there something testable here? Is there something we can just try? Just stop arguing and try something. See if it works. Is there? Sometimes there is. Sometimes there isn't. You just have to argue because it's, it's, it's purely ideological and there's nothing you can test about. It. But a lot of the time, if we can convince ourselves to stop just sharing opinions, and actually design a disciplined experiment. Disciplined experiment. Not just try something, but try something when we have defined what are our goals, what are we trying to achieve, what are the hypotheses that we are testing, um, how are we going to do it, how long would it take, how do we evaluate, at the end of the experiment, how do we know if it worked or not. If we can do that, we can save ourselves a lot of the exhausting arguments and move forward, find that change that actually works. And I want to suggest to you uh, a couple of examples. So suppose our problem is this, what you mentioned, right? <coughs> suppose we want to increase the retention of new contributors. And I want to remind you, you phrased it as how do we attract more people, right? But I want to remind you, the wiki already attracts people, remember? The wiki itself, just by existing, already attracts a lot of people. Are we doing the best job we can with those people? Because those people have already come to us. We don't need to attract them, we just need to keep them. We just need to, to not demotivate them, right? So that's why I'm phrasing it as, what can we do about the newbies who already come? How can we retain them better? And the hypotheses I made up for this example are failure, saps, reduces motivation, right? If, if you come to Wikipedia and you fail, you did something and it didn't work and someone shouted at you, that reduces your motivation, agreed? And then conflict also reduces your motivation, but recognition boosts your motivation. If someone recognizes your effort, your work, that presumably helps <coughs> your motivation. And the fourth hypothesis is recognizing good contributions is easier than preventing failure or conflict. Does that hypothesis make sense to you? Because can we guarantee someone will not fail on Wikipedia? We cannot guarantee it, right? Because people can come and, for example, innocently violate copyright, right? That leads to failure, right? They, they will have a negative result, and there's not much we can do about it. 
I mean, sure, they should have read the rules, but nobody reads the rules, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's not always possible to prevent failure. But if we can focus on giving recognition to the people, those newbies who came to us on their own and have done a good job, what if we were better at recognizing those people? Would that help retention? That's the question I propose to experiment with. And so I propose this experimental action. What if we systematically identify promising newbies using technology, for example, using Quarry? How many of you know Quarry, the tool? Okay, a few of you, good. Um, it's an amazingly powerful tool, and it's kind of a miracle and an amazing thing that it even exists. I mean, I don't know of any other big company, big organization like Wikipedia that lets you query the database directly. It's insane, uh, but we do. So uh, you can use Quarry and just find new contributors who have made substantial edits in the last three months and are still editing. Okay, that's a pretty narrow filter for promising users, right? People who showed up, decided to edit, added a bunch of content, and presumably didn't have terrible experiences because the fact is they're still editing, okay? Now, of course, not all of these will actually be great uh, promising users. Some of them will be persistent trolls, right, or vandals, some of them. But the point is, I get this list, and then I start looking at these users, and those of them who are indeed promising, what if I leave a note of appreciation on their talk page? Okay, either, you know, wiki love, like an automated thing, or a personal thing, uh, even better. And I leave a note on their talk page. This is the action I propose to experiment with. Now, let's do this for six months, okay, systematically, for six months, and then let's compare the retention of the appreciated users to some baseline rate of retention that we have measured in advance, right? Again, using Quarry, you can measure how many people join and then stop editing, right? Versus how many people stay editing. You can, you can use that as a baseline, and then check if your appreciation <coughs> intervention significantly improved the rate of retention of those promising users. Is the experiment clear? Yeah? So, you know, maybe, maybe you originally just tried to get people to do this. You said, hey, why don't we just, you know, send more Wikilove to people? And people were like, no, that doesn't make sense, etc. But if you frame it as an experiment and say, hey, let's try sending more appreciation to people and see if it's effective. And if not, we'll stop. But if it does work, we have found a way to increase retention. Yes? I think this is a great experiment, and I think every community that's represented here should try exactly this. I did work with OpenStreetMap, where we did a study that exactly observed the impact of early feedback on uh, new editors in OpenStreetMap. Yeah. And we found that um, the simple act of giving thanks and showing appreciation can be incredibly powerful as a motivator. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think my interpretation of this is in part because many people participate online and they have not met anybody in Wikipedia yet. Right. And it might be their first interaction with another human. That's right. And not only do they suddenly feel that there is another person, there's a person who appreciates what I just did. Yeah. And I think that's very positive. And so here's a good example, a, a positive um, uh, study to learn from. But, and, and of course I made, I made this example because I intuitively think that would work and it's a good idea. But, experiment, test it. Maybe it doesn't work with, uh, with Wiki Arabia people, for whatever reason, right? Maybe they actually prefer to just do their work and this early contact is uh, intimidating. I don't know, let's try. Yes? Yeah, I think we tried that from 2010. Uh -huh. Someone used to send, uh, for newbies, used to send a message like, uh, oh, you're missing categories. Uh, I know it's your, one of your first articles, so you missed uh, uh, using you didn't use categories, right? And then if the guy uh, add the category, we're gonna put a link anyway, explaining how it works. Uh, the bot will send him another message saying that congratulations, you did your first, uh, you added your first category, uh -huh. something like that. Uh -huh. Then that bot stopped around 2010 because the person in charge of Cyprus left the uh, wiki. Uh -huh. So, but okay, we have to so have this seems about. to work. Yeah, it was stopped for kind of irrelevant reasons, just because. Person yeah. went away. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the idea is if you find something that works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, move on to another experiment. Right? There are other ideas to try. 
But what I want to offer you is this idea of a culture of experimentation, this idea that we keep trying new things. Some of them will work, some of them won't. We keep trying, we keep improving. We don't just stay the way we've always been. Because, you know, we never used to do this, so we will continue not to do this. That is not a healthy, wicked approach. Uh, one last example, and with that, I'm done. Uh, what if you want something a little more complicated, like increase the coverage of undercover topics and increase the diversity of viewpoints covered, right? This is about content, not about uh, volunteers, not about people. Um, so my hypotheses here are information on Wikipedia should be verifiable. I'm sure you all know the distinction between true and verifiable. Right? What we aim for is that things have a source, that we can verify that the source actually says that, whether or not it is metaphysically, ontologically true. Um, <clears throat> and we've just had, I don't know if you followed, just in the last 24 hours, there's been a massive hoax discovered on English Wikipedia about uh, the Warsaw um, extermination camp that never existed. There was a concentration camp, but not an extermination camp. And English Wikipedia said that there was an extermination camp in Warsaw for 15 years. Uh, it's a very, very interesting hoax. It's very interesting to learn why it lasted so long. Uh, the link is on Wikipedia Weekly on Facebook. If you want, you can look at it. Um, anyway, verifiable. So, um, <clears throat> now it is difficult to cite oral knowledge without a permanent representation, right? We cannot just put something on Wikipedia and say, I heard it from that guy. Right? Like the, the actual oral knowledge, as oral knowledge, is difficult to cite on Wikipedia. And my last hypothesis uh, is reputation matters. I wrote this pretty quickly. Uh, this could be framed a little better. But the point is, the reputation of a source matters. We trust and cite the New York Times because it has a reputation right, of, of being accurate and fact-checked. And we refuse to cite um, the, the uh, Daily Mirror because it does not, right? So what if we identified a partner, a partner that is already capturing oral knowledge? There are all kinds of organizations that do that, right? All kinds of folklore, local history, <coughs> oral history projects that are already capturing, recording audio or video oral knowledge, right? And they're curating it in some kind of archive. What if we identify what? Even inside of the movement, inside of the yeah. or something like Wikipedia, for example. Something like? Something like Wikipedia, for example. Wikipedia, what about? Um, like, for example, you can say that um, I have found a few things in Marrakesh and we read about it without, like, citing it with. Uh, oh, no, Wikipedia is an example where you can get away with just something you've observed. Yeah. I'm talking about Wikipedia here, where we need a source for a claim. I'm talking about finding a partner that is already curating oral knowledge in some permanent medium, some recording or transcript or something, right? There are organizations that already do that. So you talk about to create a source. I'm talking about partners that already have potential ah. sources for us, and if we were to partner with them, review their curation practice, right? We can actually ask them, so do you just record random people or, you know, do you record anyone? Do you record only, uh, you know, I don't know, elders of a tribe? I mean, how do you pick what oral knowledge is worth recording? Like, actually ask them. Learn how they treat the knowledge that they curate. And if you think it is suitable, if you think this, this, this should be citable, this, this does sound like a pretty serious... Um, um, collection of oral knowledge, um, you can declare as an experiment, this is an experiment, remember? You can declare their material citable on wiki. Now, what does it mean for oral knowledge to be citable on wiki? That's like a whole you know, talk we can do about that, but very briefly, if, if um, to take a, a simple example, if, you, if we have a village elder who says, I don't know, uh, the world was created uh, 600 years ago, you know, according to our tradition, uh, you do not cite that in the article, you know, Age of the Universe, and say, actually, it's 600 years old, right? That, that's ridiculous. Uh, you don't use it to, to contradict solid science, for example. You can use it in the article about this tribe or about this culture to say, according to their tradition, the universe is 600 years old. And you have a citation for that, for that they think that, okay? 
So that's an example of how an oral source would make perfect sense. Because you're not asserting that the world really is 600 years old, you're asserting that this is a belief held by this culture in this context, and we know it because we heard this recording by that elder. Okay, that's an example of an oral citation that could be acceptable. Um, but that was an, an easy example. What if the knowledge does actually contradict something, but it isn't science? What about traditional names for places? Right? I'm sure there are tribal names for places here in Morocco that uh, are no longer in use because of colonialism, but these names are remembered and should be reflected in Wikipedia. Right? I don't know any examples, but you know, maybe the article about Marrakesh, about whatever, should also say in this uh, language, in this tribe's tradition, this place was called that, and it was part of this thing. Uh, and again, we may not find uh, Western academic journal articles mentioning that fact. We may only find some recording of some storyteller or, or uh, um, some um, interview that was held in the 50s with, with people who are no longer uh, around, some nomads, you know. Um, but that's what we have. It should be citable. It should be possible to cite it for what it's worth for that representation of knowledge. Now again, the reason it's so hard to get all these citations on Wikipedia is this stasis, this, this insistence that we have a notability policy, we have a verifiability policy, and if it's not secondary sources, we cannot cite it. But that's much too rigid, much too rigid. And what I'm encouraging you to do in this example is to think in your wiki, how can you experiment, experiment with maybe accepting something like this? And I, I specify the partner because I think it's too much to expect us Wikipedians to start curating a whole lot of oral citations, but there are organizations already doing that. Let's pick a good one, a serious one, a reliable one, and partner with them and see how it goes. Let's do this for a year or two, 12 to 24 months, and then evaluate, did we actually get better coverage of topics thanks to accepting these citations? Right? Has there been significant increase in coverage beyond the kind of organic increase we would expect as the wiki grows in general? And we can also count instances of patently false information discovered to have come from the partner's materials. Right? Presumably some of the stuff would be just false, fake, etc. But how much? Is it more than false facts that we cited from the New York Times? Because those exist also. Right? So again, let's, let's not be hysterical. If we find a completely false recording in that archive, that doesn't mean we should stop working with that archive forever. We should compare it to the relative um, uh, dependability of other sources that we have. And then if we like it, we can keep the partner as a citable source. And we can look for other partners. If we don't like it, we can revert all of those citations. And if we discover, no, that was actually very low quality material, and there's no guarantee that any of that is, is authentic, and leave it, and we can seek another part of it. I just wanted to draw you a slightly more complicated example of an experiment that you can do. And with that, uh, I believe I'm out of time. Yes, exactly. Uh, so I leave you with that question, what would you like to experiment with? And with the uh, message that we are here for you, we want to work with you. Uh, the, pre the previous years of this capacity building have not really touched um, Wiki Arabia so far, except in the resources that maybe you've used. We would like to work with you more. And I also want uh, those of you who may have found my thoughts about experimentation interesting, I would love it if you discuss it among yourselves in your community. And if at any point in, in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, you decide to run an experiment or you want to talk about running an experiment, I would love to be your thought partner on this. And we can help you with tools, with analysis, with advice. Um, I encourage you to think about it. Thank you very much. Yes, um, why do you set up? Can I take a question? Yes. Okay, yes, you have it. Thanks. Um, just one question. I agree with the whole cultural voice presentation and I'm all for it. Uh -huh. The problem is that in the Arabic language community or in the media, it is not really well appreciated, not well written. And I remember in the early days of the education project, we were heavily criticized because we are experimenting or we're playing, not only, like experimenting is the positive term for it, we are playing with Wikipedia, and uh, this kind of 
reverse them for anything that might go wrong. It's also helping that people are really fans of. So, yeah, okay. I, would, I, can, I, I would love to respect that, but I'm also not the only one in the community. The community is not the monopoly, but many people are not poor. I understand. Uh, that is a problem. And that's why I called it how church is poor. Because you don't have the monopoly of experimentation. It's actually something that we need to adopt as an idea, quite apart from the specific experiment. But to make progress towards that, I would suggest experimenting with experiments. So don't pick this last example of a really challenging uh, change of culture around you know, verifiability. Pick something small that, that, that can be a short experiment, an easy hypothesis, and convince people to maybe try that, something that wouldn't upset too many people. And then once you've done that experiment and you've gotten that conclusion, you can move on to another experiment, like actually build that culture of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Yes? That's not really uh, your computer. It is. You want to use um, it? Well, yes, because I don't have a correct plug for this one. Yes, so sure. I just shared mine with you. Okay. Let me move on. Okay. Thank you. Hazza, there's yeah. another question. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm taking it in a second. I'm just looking at it. Say that's uh, exactly the point where we keep media or Wikipedia fails um, in context of um, um, uh, cultures. I, I'm, I'm going to give an example, just a short example. Let's say, for example, agriculture. And uh, if we put like some scientific fact about uh, the usage of land or the productivity uh, in a hierarchy that is better than the local knowledge of some uh, uh, farmers. That's very problematic, uh, I guess. I mean, sure, science has made a lot of things to the world that I'm not a scientific skepticism or framing is everything. Yeah. So if you have some local, traditional, agricultural knowledge that isn't metaphysical, isn't about questions like when was the universe created, it's practical knowledge. Like when you, when you sow this crop next to that crop on, in October, it makes sense, whatever, right? If you have this traditional knowledge and you don't have science to back it up, you just have traditional knowledge, it's worth recording. But you frame it as, you know, in the Maghreb, it is uh, commonly practiced so and so and so and so. And that's absolutely fine. And you can cite any traditional source for that. Because you're not trying to uh, uh, claim scientific authority for it. You are presenting a widespread practice. Right? Well, I'm, I mean, good point, I, I, guess, I guess. Yeah, but again, this is a, this is a big conversation. Oral citations are a fascinating topic. I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to during the break, later, tomorrow, whenever. 